again. Um, we are so thankful to have Michael and Marcy stay. When we started this church, there were a couple of things. I think uh, a lot of people, we, we even got a book on how to start a church, and, and uh, I don't think we followed anything in that book. Uh, I think if we even tried to follow, the Lord had different ideas. But uh, he has, when we started this, we wanted, one thing for sure is we wanted to elevate and emphasize God's word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so it was our prayer that we would have men that would hold up the Bible, that would take the verses, teach them, explain them, and apply them so that we can be better Christians, grow in the Lord. And so we have been extremely blessed that God would bring men to this, to this church. And one, Michael Staten, has been the greatest pastor's heart that we've ever had. It's almost like he's on staff. We just haven't told him. So, so we'll put you on the website, Michael. you got to get cleared. Michael has a church that he's been pastor of for 20 years and they have over a thousand members in Mustang Oklahoma and yet he has been so gracious to give us his time and so we are so thankful to have a world-class Bible expositor like Michael to come and teach this Sunday and next Sunday and so please welcome Michael Thank you so much. It is really an honor to be able to be with you again. And uh, when we were here last in October, we had a chance to be able to walk through and to see this begin to take place and begin to take shape. But to be back today to see it all brought to fruition, and uh, several were able to send me pictures and videos last week, which I really enjoyed, and I've been able to watch your service online. But to be here in person just to see what the Lord uh, has done and is doing uh, is just so much cause to celebrate and, and to rejoice. We all understand that the church is the people, not the structure. However, the, the structure is not insignificant. The place that the Lord provides for His people to meet, to gather, to worship, to sing, to pray, to study, to fellowship, and to grow the place matters. Now, we understand that, that structures come and go, and, and structures can be replaced, and that the church is, is people, but this is worth celebrating. This is worth being thankful. Uh, that The place that the Lord provides for His people is a good gift from the hand of the Lord. And I know that you're aware of this, but as you look around and you just see what the Lord has done and what He continues to do, you ought to have every confidence that the Lord is doing something special here, that He is doing something really good in this place. Uh, three years ago, two years ago, uh, on a Sunday, that this is, this is a, you know, it's the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's where so many people are gone traveling. Three years ago, two years ago on this Sunday, um, we, we probably could have met in, in the office, um, and the Lord has just continued to build His church and, and to bring new people week after week after week and to get to see and celebrate what the Lord is doing. Uh, I know you're excited and grateful, but I just want to tell you from someone who's from the outside looking in and from the outside keeping up with what the Lord is, is doing here, this church has every reason to smile and to be joyful and to say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. And He's continuing to, to do a good work. And uh, I just want you to know I am so excited for you and so thankful for what the Lord continues to do. And it is just uh, a real encouragement to Marcy and I uh, to have a friendship with you and to be able to just watch and observe how the Lord is at work and in His hand of, of grace that is upon you, uh, it is an amazing, amazing thing. And so be encouraged, Trinity Bible Church. Uh, the, these are good days. Uh, and as we go forward to 2021 and next week celebrate the third anniversary of this work of the Lord, uh, what an incredible 
journey uh, you are on with the Lord, and uh, I pray that you're encouraged by what He is doing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and just dedicate our time of study to Him. Our Father, we pause and study our hearts this morning, and in so doing, we just confess our complete need for You. We open up our Bibles today because it truly is the way for us. Your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who Himself said He is the way, the truth, and the life. We can know Him as we read His words. And today as we look in John 17, we literally read the prayer that Your only begotten Son offered up for us. And so we approach this most blessed of occasions of the study and proclamation of Your Word with gratitude, with humility, and also with a sense of desperation knowing that if anything good is to come from our lives, it's going to be because You have done it. And if we are to have any answers, it's going to be because you have revealed it. And if we are going to have any success, it's because you have granted it. And our desire is that in this place on this day, every one of us will walk out of this building knowing that we have met with the living God and that through your word, we can know that we have heard You speak. And by Your grace, through the work of Your Spirit, we can understand. We pray, Lord, through Your goodness that we would obey and live all that we would learn today. It's the name of Your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to John 17. Since we were here last, as Kent mentioned, uh, my family moved to First Baptist and Mustang November of the year 2000. And so since we were here last in, in October, uh, we celebrated our uh, 20th anniversary at the church. Uh, when we went to Mustang, uh, our oldest son was almost two, and our youngest son was almost born. And uh, today, uh, our youngest son is uh, now a junior at Oklahoma State. Our oldest has now graduated college from Oklahoma University. And you put all that together. I was telling my wife back in November, I said, you really can't work anywhere for 20 years and still be young. It's just not mathematically possible. Uh, time has moved so quickly. And one of the things that you want to do, I think, when especially in a place like where Mars and I serve, where we've been so blessed to be there for 20 years now, is you want to continually remind yourself of, of just the blessing it is to gather with God's people. It's something that could become so common uh, and, and so routine that you lose sight of just the, the specialness and the uniqueness of it. I don't ever want to do that. And so at our church in Oklahoma City, now where we've served for 20 years, there is a sense in my life every Sunday as I drop to the church where I just, I'm just in awe that we get to do this. And I feel the same way here with you today. We get to gather as God's people to hear from God. I hope that never stops stunning you. We open our Bibles and we hear the very words of God. It's staggering to me. We get to pray directly to the God who created all things. We get to sing songs of praise and worship that is a pleasing delight to our God. And we don't have to wonder, what does God think? He's told us. 
And we don't have to be confused about what does God want for us. He's revealed it to us. And in the passage we look at today, as clear as any other we could turn to, I can even tell you today precisely what Jesus wants for you. And it's not because I went to seminary, and it's not because I have been in ministry for however many years. It's just because if you can read, you yourself can know with clarity and precision precisely what Jesus prays for you. It is just a stunning reality that we can open up our Bibles and say, this is what Jesus prays for His people. This is what He wants for us. This is what He desires to be true in us. And we get the incredible joy of studying it today. You can learn a lot when you listen to someone pray. In fact, I was thinking about this this weekend, that when I first began in ministry now some 27 years ago, um, I began to, to order sermon tapes from different preachers all around the country. And I was in seminary, and I was working full-time at the church, and, and I just wanted to, to devour as much Bible teaching as I could. And so I, I would get these sermon tapes, and I would just listen to them day after day after day after day, learning how to preach, learning how to study the God's Word, trying to know God's Word better. And what I began to realize is the men who preach the Word so powerfully are men that if you listen to their prayers, you learn theology. Because when the people of God truly cry out to the Lord in prayer, what those prayers should be filled with are spiritual theological truths that just come oozing out of our vocabulary as we cry out to the Lord in desperate prayer. And to this day, I can tell you that some of the greatest theological training I received were those early days in my ministry where I just on cassette tapes would listen to men of God pray with their church. You listen to somebody pray, and you can hear their heart, and you can learn from their mind, and you can, you can learn to grasp their will and what they desire. It was an amazing time for me to learn theology just through listening to men pray. Even today, I love to listen to people who love the Lord. I love to listen to them pray. I love at, at our church, we gather with our, with our leaders about half an hour before our first worship service, and we just physically get on our knees and we just pray. And it's a group of men who are desperate for the Lord to work and desperate for the Lord to move. And it is one of the real highlights of my Sunday every Sunday morning to gather there in a, in a room in our church. And it's just some of my dearest friends who I serve in ministry with. And we just cry out to the Lord. And as I listen to these men pray every Sunday at my church, I'm just blessed by that. I love when I come here to preach because one of the things your elders do every Sunday, exact same thing. We gather in a room. And uh, my first time to get to be in, in, in the new room uh, to, to gather to pray this morning. And I just get to hear their heart. And I get to hear coming forth from them what's on their mind. And as I hear them pray for the Lord to be glorified in this place, and I hear them pray for you, it's such a blessing and a, and a teaching time for me as I just get to be blessed by hearing the prayers of your leaders here in this place. One of the things I do every single Sunday morning when I go to my church early and, and begin to pray through my notes one last time, uh, I have a book, many of you are probably familiar with it, called The Valley of Vision. It's a collection of old Puritan prayers. I read it every Sunday morning before I go out to preach. 
and just listening to godly men from years and years ago whose prayers were collected together, and I read their prayers, and my heart just resonates with their spirit as they cry out to the Lord. Well, there's something helpful and instructive when you listen to people pray. But what could be more staggering than hearing the words prayed by none other than our Savior Himself? The Lord in His kindness has given us His Word and preserved it where we can read it and memorize it and sing it and preach it and understand it. I don't know if there's anything as sweet and in the providence of God as merciful as the truth that we can actually know not only what Jesus prayed, but specifically what He prayed for you. That's what we see in John 17. As we go through John 17, the, the latter part of it today, we, we could divide this up a few different ways. If you're building an outline from John 17, there, there's a few different ways you could organize the thoughts of it. You've got Jesus praying for Himself. You've got Jesus praying for His disciples. You've got Jesus praying for those who will believe. Um, you've got Jesus praying for things, how they should be done on earth. You've got Jesus praying for how things will be one day in heaven. You've got Jesus praying for uh, those who are belonging to Him and, and how they should live now. And then you've also got this hope of future glory that He mentions. Lots of different ways that we could talk about this, but I think maybe the most helpful for us today as we look specifically in verses 20 to 26 is to think in terms of this is what Jesus prays for His own. This is the Savior's prayer for His people. And I, I think this is very helpful because I think there are many times where we say to ourselves, I don't really know what to pray for. Or you get to a new year like we're about to begin, and, and we start to think in terms of, I want to make some changes. Something about a new year is just a, a helpful time to, to make some changes in our lives. But sometimes spiritually, we may come to the place of wondering, what, what does God really want me to do? Or how would I pray for myself as we enter a new year? Well, the beauty of, of this passage is you don't have to wonder what to pray for yourself. You just pray for yourself the very things Christ has prayed for His own people and make this your prayer as we go into this year. Let's look at it together. We're going to look specifically in verses 20 to 26, but let me back up to verse 13 if I can. For those who were with us last week, as Dr. Lawson was here, you'll have a little bit of, of review of, of these verses. If you weren't able to be here, uh, it'll help set the context for you. The Lord says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. This is you. This is Jesus saying, Father, I am praying for those who through the work of the disciples and the ministry of the church are going to come to faith. This is Jesus praying in John 17 for future believers. Church, this is Jesus praying for you. This is an amazing reality that the Scripture tells us. 
I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who also believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them." So what does Jesus pray for you? What does Jesus want for you? Let me list these out. I'm going to give you seven of these. A few of these will be review from the passage I just read, and a few of these from verses 20 to 26. First thing He prayed for you is that you would have joy. We saw that in verse 13, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Jesus wants you to have joy. He wants His joy to be in you. And let me just remind you here, by way of review from last week, from the passage you covered, that one of the hallmarks of those who belong to Christ is that we have an abiding joy. It is a problem when God's people are filled with bickering, and complaining when God's people are endlessly unhappy. That's a problem because one of the things the Lord has prayed for His own is that they would be people who have the joy of the Lord and that it would radiate through them. So pray for yourself to be joyful. It's been said, if a man can rob you of your joy, he can rob you of your usefulness. I think that's true. We should be a joyful people. And look, everybody understands this has been an exceedingly difficult year. And uh, as as I reminded my church, much to their chagrin a couple of of weeks ago, there is nothing about going from midnight, December 31st, 2020, to 1201, January 1st, 2021, that's going to make the world all better. But if you've been waiting on that, I'm sorry. Some of you waited at Y2K for the world to end, and now you're waiting for 2021 to make everything beautiful again. Listen, you're going to go from midnight to the next day, and the news of the world is going to be the same. I'm really sorry if that's breaking news to you. My church looked at me like they were stunned when I told them that. But nothing's going to automatically get easier in a few days. But can I remind you, child of God, you have everything you need for joy. You have everything you need for joy. Let the joy of the Lord shine in all that you do. This is what the Lord has prayed for us. He prays, secondly, for our purity. We saw that last week in verses 14 to 16. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. The Lord has a plan for you, and His plan for you is that you would be here in the world, but not of the world. That you would be kept pure and and holy, but that you would be involved and engaged in doing the work of the Lord in this world. And understand that Jesus here is not praying for your escape. He's praying for your victory. There's a difference. He wants you to be in this world, loving, serving, reaching out, engaged in evangelism, engaged in missions, engaged in meeting the needs of those who are hurting. Engage in having spiritual conversations to share with them the hope of Jesus Christ. He's not praying for your escape. 
He's praying for your victory, your purity, your holiness. And so Christians are not to withdraw from the world. We're to be engaged in ministry, but to do so in a way that keeps our heart only in love with the Lord. The third thing he prays in verse 17 is that we would live in truth. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth, verse 17 says. He prays that we would know the truth. And the way that we know the truth is by knowing his word. So this is a good time for me to stop and just ask you this question. Do you have a game plan for how you are going to learn God's word better in the year to come? What, what's your plan for reading God's Word? What's your strategy for memorizing God's Word next year? What's your plan for how you're going to learn more of His Word so that it can lead you to a deeper place of worship and obedience with the Lord? Listen, we don't stumble into holiness. Holiness comes because we've made a commitment to sanctify our hearts in the truth of God's Word. What's your plan for 2021 for how to know the truth and how to memorize and meditate upon the truth of God's Word? Fourthly, he prayed for our purpose. We saw that in verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I also have sent them into the world. You've been sent, you've been commissioned by the Lord. You have a purpose to live your life. Hebrews 12 tells us that we're to lay aside the weight and lay aside the sin that so easily entangles us. And if we're going to run with purpose, we're going to have to lay aside the weight. We're going to have to lay aside the things that we hold on to so that we can run with, with purpose. Jesus prayed this for his people, that they would live with purpose. You know, one of the things that I, I struggle with is I love the Christmas season so much, um, which for me begins October 1st, and so I'm, I'm coming to the end of, a, of the three-month Christmas season. I love the Christmas season so much, and th- th- I'm being serious, this, this is really a struggle for me, it really is, that when Christmas is over... Um, and I, I, I feel it. And I struggle because all I want to do is fast forward from December 26th to Christmas the next year. So much so that part of helping me through this is Mars and I were driving around running some errands yesterday, and I began to talk out loud to plan some Christmas events for 2021. It helps me deal with the sadness. But I told her yesterday, I said, at, at my age, you re- I really probably ought to stop wishing my life away because I'm getting to the age where I'm going to want some of those days back. I'm 47 now, and, you know, I mean, I'm not like 100 yet, but I'm not a young man anymore, and I really don't want to wish too many seasons of life away. What I've got to train my mind to do is to live with purpose now, not just always waiting for what you wish would come. Now, I've preached long enough to know biblically, I've got the preacher's answer here. I, I get it. Tomorrow's not promised to me. I know that. But if I'm not careful, I will go through a lot of my year waiting, anticipating, longing for what's yet to come. And if I do that too much, I could miss what's now. Listen, it's always tempting for God's people to live for what's next and to miss what's now. Jesus prayed that His people would live with purpose. 
Some of you are in life stages that are very difficult and challenging, and all you want is for that pain to go away, that struggle to be removed, that difficulty to be alleviated. But don't miss what God has for you now. This is how He prayed for you. He prayed that you would live with purpose as you've been sent into the world. Jesus came into the world with purpose, and so you've been sent with purpose. And every single situation you face is an opportunity for you to embrace God's purpose for you right in the midst of it. He prayed that we would live with purpose. Brings us to verse 20. And let's add on a few things from verses 20 to 26 that the Lord prayed for us. He prayed, fifth, that we would have unity. That we would have unity. He says that, I pray that they would all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. Jesus prays here for unity among all believers. Now, we've got to be very careful, church, because of all the things in Scripture that often get twisted out of context, this may be number one on the list. You hear all the time people talk about, you know, the Lord prayed for unity among His people. We should just be one. We should just get along. We, we shouldn't let anything divide us. And so what you do, if you want to keep everybody getting along, then you've got to really put sin on the back burner because talking about sin doesn't help people feel better about themselves. And you may have some people who don't believe that Christ was really born of a virgin and lived a sinless life, so we, we, we shouldn't talk too much about that. And we don't want to talk about His miracles because some people don't really believe in miracles, and we probably shouldn't talk much about hell because that's certainly going to divide people. And what you end up getting are churches who are left with nothing, all the while saying, but we're, we're living for unity. And after all, Jesus prayed for unity. But can I remind you that His prayer for unity comes from the same prayer as verse 17 that says, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. There is no biblical unity apart from knowing the truth. You can get together with people and everybody gets along. But if it's not built upon the truth of who Jesus Christ is, you do not have biblical unity. Unity is always founded upon the truth. Philippians 2.2, 2, Paul prays that the people would be united in spirit. It's a word that, that literally translated would say one-souled. The people had one soul, S-O-U-L. That's what it means to have true unity. You have one soul, one spirit. You're united in purpose, and you're united in the truth. The thing that makes this church special, every true church where the Lord Jesus reigns over, is because it's people who know who the biblical Jesus is, and they are committed to believing and living the truth of Christ. When Jesus prayed that His people would be one, it wasn't some just nebulous prayer of let's just all like each other. It was a prayer of saying let's be united in the truth. We must know the Word of God. We must believe what Christ teaches. We must believe that He came to save sinners from hell and judgment. And so you have no true unity if you do not understand what sin is. And you don't have salvation if you don't know what you've been saved from. We must be united, but we're united in the truth. The Bible describes this a couple of different ways. One, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, the Bible describes unity as a body. 
when it talks about it in 1 Corinthians 12, the spiritual gifts, how we're, we're like a body, and, and the eye doesn't do what the foot does, and, and on and on and on. Every member has its purpose. The body works together with different functions. That's what biblical unity is. Biblical unity is not we go easy on the truth and don't speak of things that people may not like. That's not unity. Unity is we're built upon the truth. We preach, proclaim, and declare the truth. And as we do, we each serve as the Lord has gifted us in a way that the entire body is now made stronger. That's biblical unity. That we have the same passion, the same truth. We're not all the same personality. We're not all the same in spiritual giftedness. Different roles, different functions. But we're one souled, one purpose, unified in what the Lord has called us to do. The Bible also gives an example that, that the believers are like a family. Ephesians 1, 5, we've been adopted through the work of Christ. We're a family. And in a family, everyone has a place. At our home growing up, by God's grace, we enjoyed a, a unified home. Not because everybody had the same role or the same function, but because everybody had a place. There was truth in our home, and there were rules in our home, and there were non-negotiables in our home, but everybody had a place, and we experienced unity. And in the church... It's a picture of how we should live, unified like a body, unified like a family. We're not all half, we're not all robotic. We don't need to all look the same and dress the exact same and talk the exact same and have the same hobbies and interests. There's room for all kinds of diversity among the body of Christ. Yet we're unified in the truth. Listen. Don't fall for the satanic deception that you, that you chase unity at all costs. That's a danger. Unity is experienced by those who together believe in the truth. If you have no truth, you have no biblical unity. So Christ prays for His people, and He prays that we would be unified. But it's a unity that comes from knowing the truth. Let's go back to verse 21. I pray that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So that, so the unity is going somewhere, okay? The purpose of why the church is unified, we have a so that, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Don't miss this. Biblically speaking, the unity of the true church is an evangelistic tool. In fact, one man said long, long time ago, speaking of this, divisions in the church breed atheism in the world. We are to be unified in the truth so that the world may believe. Our unity becomes for us a strong weapon to help people understand that the gospel we preach is true. This church needs to be known for being a unified body. It does not mean that everyone has the exact same opinion on all things. It does not mean that you would have to do the exact same, make the same decision that someone else in leadership may make. There's room for people to have differences of preference or opinion or insight. But permeating through all of that is a unity 
that is real and is lasting, and the world sees it, and they have reason to believe that you are convinced that Jesus is who He said He was. You've likely heard the story of, I think it was Ben Franklin who went to hear one of his favorite preachers, and somebody said to him, do you even believe what he's saying? And he said, I don't know, but I'm convinced he believes it. That ought to be true of this church. The watching world says, I am convinced that something is happening there because there is a unity among these people unlike anything the world has. Amen? Right. He prayed for you that you would be unified. Let me give you a sixth thing. He prayed for you that one day you would be home, that you would be home. He prayed in verse 24 for our future home, our forever home. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Our home is that we will be with Him. When I was here a few months ago, we were looking in John 14 in part about the promise of heaven. I think I mentioned then that if I were ever going to write a book on heaven, it would be the, the world's shortest book. It would have one chapter, and the chapter would have one page, and the page would have one sentence. Here's what heaven is. You will be with the Lord. That's all I need to know. I just need to know that I'm with Him. And Jesus prayed for you and for all of His people for the day we would be with Him where He is. When somebody says to you, how do you know for sure you're going to be in heaven when you die? How do you know for sure that, that heaven is your home? I mean, after all, your faith may be strong today, but what about tomorrow's trial? Today, you, you're, you're doing well, but, but who knows what the next year has in store? Let me tell you something. As we learned back earlier in the Gospel of John, it is Jesus Himself who prepares a place for you. And it is now Jesus Himself who reveals His will that you would be with Him. The Lord Himself prayed, anticipating the day that all of the future believers would be in heaven, in glory with Him. In fact, in the King James Version, it says it this way of John 17, 24, Father, I will that they also be with me where I am. It is the will of Christ that you as His child be with Him in heaven forever. Amen. This astounds me because half the time I don't even want to be with myself. Half the time I get tired of myself, the things I do and the things that I say. I don't know how anybody else even wants me around. I don't even want to be around me most of the time. And yet Jesus not only allows you as His child to be with Him in heaven, He desires you as His own to be with Him in heaven. This just blows my mind. Jesus is not some reluctant Savior. And Jesus is not praying in John 17 the prayer of, you know, what else am I going to do? I mean, I, I promised Him heaven. Heaven's a long time. What are we going to do with all these people? Jesus prays, Father, they will be with me. That's all the heaven I need. Amen? With the Lord. Sometimes I fear that we look at our life and we're rightly broken for our sin and we're 
rightly aware of all of our failures and I think sometimes we may take that to an unbiblical extreme and we get to a place of almost self-loathing and we get this idea that, that the Lord can't really love us. Can I tell you, if your sin has been forgiven by Jesus Christ, you are loved and welcomed home by Him. Rest in this truth, beloved. Jesus prayed for you for the day when you would be home with Him. Back to Hebrews 12 again where it tells us to lay aside the weight and the sin and to run with endurance the race set before us. It says that we're to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the what? Joy set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame. What was the joy? What is it that when Jesus was going to the events of the cross, what is it that gave Christ joy that he stayed focused on while he endured the horrific nature of the cross? Well, it was doing the Father's will. It was bringing glory to his Father. And John 17 also tells us that part of the joy set before him was the joy of knowing that forever in heaven, his own people would be with him. It's an amazing truth. You know, for so many of us as we go through this world, I mean, there's things we enjoy, and there's things that bring a smile to our face, and there's things that make us laugh, but for the people of God, don't you just feel like you're just always a, a, a step out of being in tune with the world? I mean, this, this world's just, it's just never home. Now, there's things we enjoy, and God's given us plenty of good gifts, and certainly gathering with the church is, is a blessing, and being able to have Christian friends is, is a wonderful thing, and being able to celebrate Christmas with your family is a wonderful, there's plenty of good things, but don't you just kind of feel like you're just always out of step with the world? If we just understand as believers, we're, we're not one new car away from being at home in the world. You're not one new home away from having everything you've ever wanted. That's just, the world is, it's just not that way for us. But there is a day when you will be home. There is a day where you will have everything your heart desires and nothing of this world can satisfy. There is a day when you as a child of God will say, this, this is home. I'm here. I'm at home. I'm at peace. I'm at rest. I'm in a place of worship. I'm in a place of fellowship. And that place is going to be heaven. And what will make heaven heaven is that you will be with Christ. Because he's prayed for it to happen. One of the things that brought him joy as he set his mind to endure the cross was his prayer for the day when we will be with him. If you want a definition of heaven, here it is. You will be with him. Home with him. So just a, an important question for you here. One of the clearest ways to know if you're going to heaven is to consider this. The way to know the question about then is to ask yourself, where are you finding your joy now? For those truly in Christ, we find our only glory in Him and long for the day when we will be fully with Him. If your idea of heaven 
could be satisfied with all the things of this world that you've never had that you wanted, and it doesn't include Christ, you're longing for something less than a child of God longs for. Heaven is that you are home with the Lord. Let me give you one last thing he prayed for his people. In verses 25 and 26, he prayed that we would be a people of love. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known so that, so again, we know where this is supposed to take us, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them. He prayed that we'd be a people of love. Now, I could summarize John 17, 6 to 20. You, if you want to... If you want just a shorter outline, you could summarize what the Lord wants for His people in these three words, truth, unity, love. And they're all connected together. Don't you find it interesting that this world is okay with two-thirds of that? The world's good with unity. The world's good with love. But what holds those two things together is truth. And if you take truth away, then whatever you have is something less than biblical unity and biblical love. Truth is essential for God's people to have true unity and to experience true love. He says in verse 25, O righteous Father, which is a reminder that biblical love is based on a knowledge of God. One Father, and He is righteous. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 7 and 8 that God is love. When we speak of the name of God, we're talking about a God who Himself is love, but it's also a God, verse 17, who has revealed to us His truth. And far too many times, as has been well written, doctrine has impressed our minds, but has not pierced our hearts. It is the knowledge of the truth that brings us to unity and love. Truth, unity, and love. Biblical love should be lived out in deeds and not just in our words. And so we could say this, that, that our love should flow from our theology. One of the things that great churches like this one need to be on guard on is it's possible for people to love knowledge and to love to study theology, and yet it never goes from their mind to their heart, and they become puffed up with knowledge and, and theological intellect, and yet never become a people of love. Well, that's not the Lord's will for us. Understand in the same prayer that he prayed for your knowledge of the truth, verse 17, he also prays that you would have an evident love. So you ask yourself, is your relationship with the Lord helping you become a more loving person? Is the way that you study the Bible and the way that you read and the way that you live your devotional life, is it making you more loving? And we've got to be careful, friends, because it's very possible for us to become so frustrated with this world that we stop having love and grace. That's not what Christ prayed for you. He prayed that here in this world, you would be joyful, you would be pure, 
you would be loving, even in the midst of a hard, dark world. He prayed that His joy would be in you and His love would be in you. Church, praise the Lord. We don't have to make a decision between will we be people of the truth or will we be people of love. They go together. Don't let your study of theology ever cultivate within you a coldness or a harshness. That's not how Christ prayed for you. He prayed that you'd be a people of truth, and that truth would unite the people of God together. And what the world would see is a unity unlike anything they experience, and a love unlike anything they have. Our unity and our love become our evangelism to let people know Jesus saves. And so he says at the very end, I pray that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Christ is with us, among us, and in us, and He shines the most clearly when His love radiates through us. If you're wondering, how do I pray for myself entering a new year? If you're wondering, what kind of vocabulary can I use in my prayers that my heart would be in tune with the will of God Wonder no longer. He has told you because Christ Himself has prayed for you. He prayed that you would live in joy and live in purity and live in truth and live with purpose and live in unity and live with your forever home in mind and that you would live in love. Parents, let your children hear you pray for them. Don't just pray for them, pray with them. When you have times of Bible study at home as a family, when you put your little ones to bed at night, let your children hear the sound of mom and dad praying for them. Listen carefully as your elders pray for you. When they pray in a Sunday worship service, it's not just a time of transition. It's not just because we're trying to go from announcements to song or song to Scripture. Listen carefully when your elders pray and be blessed and encouraged by getting the insight into the heart of your elders' love for you as they pray for you. And more than anything, listen when your Savior prays for you. And in His kindness, He recorded it for us in John 17, where none other than Christ Himself prays for you. And you can take the whole chapter and put it on these three pillars. He prayed that you would live in truth, love, and unity. And when you pursue those three things, this place becomes so different than the world, that you won't want the world, and yet it will be so unique to the world, they'll be convinced you really believe this. So we come to the end of not just John 17, we come to the end of 2020. We come to the end of a hard year. We come to the end of a year where there's been a lot of loss and fear and anxiety and a lot of questions. And if it's taught us anything as believers, it's taught us that this world is not our home. Amen? 
Here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city which is to come. And can I tell you, for those who are covered by the grace of Jesus Christ, one day when you take your last breath and you go from this life to the life to come, if you are in Christ, you will be with Him. And not only will it be the sweetest instant of your life, it will literally be the answer to His prayer for you. He desires you to forever be with Him. So you feel out of step with this world? You feel a little bit overlooked by this world? Feel a little bit like no matter what, this world's just not the place for you? Take heart, dear believer. Your home is secure. Your Savior is waiting. And He has prayed for the day that you will be with Him. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. What a sweet assurance comes to our heart as we've had the privilege of listening to Your Son pray for His own people. Lord, help us to be truth seekers. Help us to live in unity with Your people. Help us to have hearts and lives that show love. And Lord, as we long to be with You, we take comfort in knowing that You long for us to be home with You as well. And one day we'll be there. Praise be to God that You sent Your Son to die that we might live. That You left the glories of heaven, dear Jesus, that one day we could be home in heaven with You. To the praise of God alone. Amen.